what topics do we have? For, oh, first is FTX. What, what is going so, on there? You just proved my point. I feel like these days, everywhere I turn, everywhere I look, there's FTX. I see it more than I see you. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere, it's sponsoring lunch. What is, what is FTX doing? I like how you pick the topics, and for those that don't know, as soon as she, as soon as they show the graphic, I don't know what the topics are until uh, we see this it. kind of like a little rapid fire. Like uh, FTX, I think the bigger story, it, obviously FTX is uh, they've extended a line of credit to uh, Voyager, to BlockFi, they've bought Embed. Like there, there's a bunch of things that they're doing here. Uh, what I would say is FTX is uh, part of the story, but Sam Bankman-Fried also is the founder of Alameda uh, Research. He's also the what founder do we have of FTX. To know about him? Well, the big question now is uh, you could make an argument that he is the Warren Buffett of crypto mm. in this exact situation. And what I mean by that is go back to 2008, uh, and, and really Warren Buffett's been doing this his entire career, uh, but 2008 was a great example where the global financial crisis occurred. He had a lot of cash. He, quote unquote, was patient and was uh, waiting for some sort of market downturn. When others were uh, being uh, fearful, he was being greedy, and he stepped in um, and take Goldman Sachs as an example. He actually offered Goldman Sachs $5 billion, and it came out, I think, two years ago that uh, it's estimated he made about $3 billion on that $5 billion bet. Yeah. Not bad. And so when you start to look at uh, that situation, what you can see is that Warren Buffett's entire strategy, have a big balance sheet, be patient, and strike, be ready. Yeah, strike when others are fearful or where there's some sort of market downturn. And so the question now is like, is that what Sam Bankman fried FTX, Alameda, and kind of his family of companies, is that what they're doing? And it appears that that is exactly it. They have a strong balance sheet. They've got great cash flow. They've talked a number of times uh, publicly about how uh, when they went to raise the last round of funding, a lot of VCs were like, hey, why don't you guys have more employees? You only have 200 employees at FTX. Like, what, why don't you have more employees? And they're like, because we don't need more employees. Like, We get the production we need out of the employee base that we have. Well, now in a market downturn, all of a sudden, they seem poised to strike. And so, again, it doesn't mean that the bets they're making now will end up paying off. It doesn't mean that the bets they're making now uh, are the right bets to make. Uh, so there's still some selection that needs to happen, and we're going to not have the answers for this for five years or so. Uh, but there are a lot of similarities between strong balance sheet, aggressiveness in a market downturn, uh, and the ability to capitalize when others are fearful between Warren Buffett and Sam bankman fried does that also, can you apply that macro view to an individual investor as well, that framework? Of course, a any individual, right? I mean, there's a lot of, take kind of the market sentiment, if you will, off of Twitter right now. There's a lot of folks who are saying, hey, uh, I dollar cost average, right? And whatever asset, could be stocks, could be Bitcoin, could be real estate, uh, whatever. And by dollar cost averaging, what I essentially do is I just pick a number and every single week or month, I just go ahead and I buy. Now, all of a sudden, if take Bitcoin, uh, I was dollar cost averaging over the last you know, five years or two years, and the price of the asset kept going up and up and up and up. And now I turn around and the price has dropped significantly. You actually may see people say, OK, I'm going to accelerate my dollar cost averaging. I'm going to try to pounce when there's some sort of price drawdown. Right. Now, again, there's always this risk of, of uh, are you buying a great asset? So the price has dislocated from the underlying fundamentals. Uh, and so therefore, you're getting a quote unquote discount to the value you're buying. Or the risk is, are you actually uh, just catching a falling knife? If something was at $69,000, you buy it at 20 and it's on its way to zero, then like that was a stupid investment. And so that's where uh, the like evaluation. Bake, bake in room for error, right? Like you're not Margin of safety. Perfect. Yes, margin of safety. That that's is the uh, that is the term uh, that would be used. <laughs> and uh, again, timeless investing principle from Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, et cetera, is uh, – buying something where even if something goes wrong, there's a margin of safety. So if you think something's worth, let's say $100, and you buy it at 40, the margin of safety is 60. So if it loses 50% of the, the value, you still would be up because you bought it at 40, now it's worth 50. And so that's exactly how uh, this ends up playing out is the timeless investing principles. They always, always. play out. When I and Sam Make Me Free, I think, is doing something similar. What's up with the gas tax? When I buy things on sale, margin of safety. All right. I don't know how that applies. I just think it's cool. Okay. <laughs> so pre <laughs> President Joe Biden said that he is seriously considering a temporary halt in the federal gas tax as the White House looks to, step, to take steps to lower the cost of the pump ahead of the July 4th 
weekend when tens of millions of Americans are expected to hit the road. So is he basically trying to like ease the burden on Americans wanting to take road trips? I think that uh, it is undeniable that gasoline prices in America are uh, not in a good situation. Um, and so when you see that, you then have to ask yourself, OK, uh, what can they do about it? There are long term solutions like, I don't know, uh, allow for more American drilling, encourage uh, nuclear power uh, so that we can offload some of uh, um, the, the attention on energy and then we can use natural gas or oil um, and, and uh, bring that online. They could go and they could negotiate deals with uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, et cetera. And so when you start to see all these different things that they could do over the long term, you realize that doesn't solve the short term problem. Yeah. And so the short term problem is either one, tell people hang in there and just experience the pain. Two is they can try something like this around taxes. So if you drop the tax, yeah, sure, maybe it'll have a little bit of an impact, but it's not going to take, you know, five dollar a gallon of gas down to three dollars. So what is it? What is it? Uh, it's probably pennies. Um, oh, are you serious? In, in terms, yeah, but it, think of it this way. I, I don't know exactly yeah, what yeah, the tax yeah. is. If you have five dollar gas, and let's say that that tax is, uh, I don't know, fifty cents. Right. I'm not a mathematician, but like that would be at least trending in the right direction because you're getting a 10 percent less gasoline price. And so I don't think it's just 50 cents. It's smaller than that. But at least it's something that they could try. And then the uh, last piece of this um, is that they could actually issue uh, some sort of gas card to Americans. Like a rebate or re rebate. It's kind of like the stimulus checks, but and do it for gas. The White House said that would be a stretch. So they considered it, which is why I bring it up. I think it would be stupid of them to do this because mm. uh, it would basically be a form of UBI. Uh, you'd be not only giving people money, as you did with the stimulus checks, and we saw that led to inflation. Uh, but on top of that, what they would be doing is they would then be telling people, hey, by the way, we're going to give you this money, and you can only spend it on this one thing. And so at what point do you start to say, well, like, oh, well, if we do it for gas, we should do it for food, too. Food's up 12 percent, you know, to eat at home. And so when you start to think through um, kind of what they should do yeah. in the short term, I don't think there's very many things that they can do except for the tax. So yeah. to me, this is the thing where they eventually get to uh, evaluate all of their options and they conclude the only thing we can do that will have an impact is the gas tax. I think people are saying it's 18 cents. Again, 18 cents. I mean, you know. If you you it's a it's a big difference when it all adds up, right? Sure, um, but also I think that people would rather have three dollar gasoline for the next ten years than have five dollar gasoline and have an eighteen cent you know tax uh, removal for what? What are we gonna do just for July fourth? We just gonna have a, a tax holiday for July fourth only, and then what happens in August? You keep paying your taxes. Um, wait, can I, can we do a very quick <laughs> yes. short Bitcoin break? You know what's crazy to me? Oh, Bitcoin at 21500 Yeah. Hmm. Um, but it's going to change in the next, like, 20 seconds. Don't believe what you hear. It's very volatile. Uh, <laughs> it changes a lot. Who, okay. Who's paying you? I don't the know. Oh, my God. Dollar maximalists okay. are paying you? <laughs> Wait, hold on. Spread oh. that FUD. Go ahead. Fudge. Um, what I want to say is that uh <laughs> come on sorry i forgot you lost i had a train of thought oh yeah yeah um so i was looking at the bitcoin price and i remember in 2017 when bitcoin hit 20k and how many people were like over the moon excited like running around doing naked laps not you not you i'm not not you um <laughs> who's doing naked laps i don't laps? know but people on the internet and now when Bitcoin's at 20,000, people are depressed. It's so, I would love like, to see your search history. Is everything. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Of course. Fear it's and greed wild. index. Fear and greed index. Fuck. You can hit you can hit a number uh, in value, and everyone's like, oh, my God, this is amazing. You go and hit the same number on the way down, and people are like, this sucks. And It's just crazy. It's just, it's just market. It's psychology. It's market sentiment. Again, timeless investing principles apply here. You What's going on with unemployment? Okay. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. I had a great idea. I'll share it later. It wasn't um, a good idea. So you don't know my idea. Narrator, it wasn't <laughs> a good idea. All right, uh, unemployment. So uh, Larry Summers, do you know who that is? See, this is my problem with these headlines. <laughs> this is my problem with well, these headlines. It's a bad headline. No, it's a bad headline. This is my problem with these headlines. I know, I know. 
I don't I don't know who Steve Goldstein is. I'm sure he's a nice guy. U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers says that there needs to be a surge in unemployment in order to cool inflation. Like, do they understand? That's not what he said. This is not what he said. Literally, that is fake news. He does not want people to lose their jobs. So, okay. But hold on. He did say there needs to be a lasting period of higher unemployment to contain inflation. Listen, you guys want examples of the bullshit that goes on in the mainstream media? Anthony. This is a perfect example. This is a kid's show. No, this is a perfect example. Larry Summers, who's a former Treasury Secretary, said mm-hmm. that he believes that we are going to have to have 5% unemployment in America in order to curb inflation. What he is saying <laughs> is a chain reaction. So we have high inflation now, 40 year high. What ends up occurring is the Federal Reserve says, shit, there's so much demand, it's pulling prices, there's all these issues, monetary policy, fiscal policy, supply chain, geopolitical challenge, all this stuff. We have to get inflation under control. We're going to make the cost of capital more expensive. We're gonna raise interest rates. We're gonna conduct quantitative tightening. We're gonna be a net seller in the market rather than a net buyer. You're gonna take away that a persistent bid in the market. When we do that, asset prices are going to come down and we are going to destroy demand for goods and services. Of course, if demand for goods and services ends up actually getting destroyed, then the revenue of businesses goes down. The revenue of businesses is going to go down. They say, shit, we have to also take our expenses down or we're just going to lose money. If we have to take our expenses down, what do we do? One of the things is layoffs. And so there's a direct line between Raising interest rates, conducting quantitative tightening, crashing asset prices, market downturn. You get companies who say, shit, get your expenses under control. They do layoffs. Unemployment rate goes up. So he is not saying he hopes that this happens. He's not saying he wants it to happen. He's saying that it's going to have to happen in order to curb inflation. I know. And literally in the article, it says, put a different way. Summers is calling for the unemployed rolls to swell to roughly 16. Million. So this is his exact quote. We need five years of unemployment above 5% to contain inflation. We need, in other words, we need two years of 7.5% inflation, five years of 6% inflation, or one year of 10% unemployment. There are numbers that are remarkably discouraging relative to the Fed Reserve view. Now, when you look at that, that's what he said. That's a direct quote when, from When him. he said inflation, he meant to read unemployment. I don't know why you changed unemployment oh. as inflation. <laughs> now, go back to the headline. Explain to me how you read that quote and you hear what he said, and then you get this. Here's why Larry Summers wants 10 million people to lose their jobs. To, to be fair, it's probably not the reporter who wrote the headline, so let's cut him some slack. I, I, what, I don't know what, uh, uh, I think this was Market Watch yeah. that did this. Again, I don't care if it's the reporter, the editor, the CEO, or the janitor. It doesn't matter who created the headline. That is bullshit. And the reason is because it creates all sorts of divisiveness where now people are like, oh, Larry Summers, he wants everyone to suffer, the elites versus everyone else. Like, no, this is a distraction. (laughs) It's a bad situation right now. The average American family is suffering. And if they continue to create this divisiveness where it's simply saying, oh, the people in charge, the people who are insiders, they hate you, it creates divisiveness. Just say what he said. Or be informed and think for yourself. Okay, Keep TikTok going. has moved its US user data to Oracle's cloud platform. The decision addresses concerns from US officials that the social media company's Chinese ties could pose national security risks. But then I read another article that said that Chinese based or China based staff can access the US based. Uh, uh, I'm out on the TikTok what? data I know, saga. I, I don't, I don't know what's going on. Uh, data is just like, it just like hides. Like they just like put it in the cloud. Like, I don't know, look up in the sky. Where is it? Right? Like if you think. Do you know how the internet works? <laughs> it, duh. And of course they're like, no, oh, it it's in Oracle's database. It's in this database. It's in this database. Like it doesn't matter what database if the same employees have access to the database. That's what I don't understand. Is they're acting as if the concern is somebody is hacking TikTok's well, data. That's not the concern. The concern is that you have employees in another country that we may or may not be friendly with who have access to data. Whether you agree or not with it, that is the thing that people are concerned about. And so to say, oh, we're going to take the user's data and the employee's access to that data, and we're just going to move it to a different database, doesn't solve the problem that the employees still have access to it. 
I know. I don't know. It's just, I... So and we don't have all the information either. Yeah. So many of my friends are on TikTok, and I'm like, I don't think they care. I'm the only person in America that's on TikTok, but not on TikTok. No, you're not. So am I. So are a lot of people. No, no, no. I'm on TikTok, but I'm not on TikTok. He doesn't have an account, but he can look at the... No. I don't even have no. an app. I, there's videos of me that get posted every day. But the oh. team posts them. I don't go Wait, on you're TikTok. You're on TikTok? Oh, yeah, yeah. We're balling on TikTok. Oh, Let me I, tell you, I'm all the young kids. They're like, yo, Pop, what up? TikTok. And I'm like, what did I post? Says that. I don't even know. He says that. Second of all, are you dancing on there? No. What are you doing? I actually have only seen a couple of the videos, and it's me talking. You know, we're, you know, educating the kids. Who is, what kids are watching him talk? Lewis, who some of you don't know. Uh, messaged us one day and he goes, shit, they got me. I'm addicted. <laughs> <laughs> it's an easy one. Oh, that's why I'm not going on. They ain't getting me. They're, they're so good. It's like, you know, when you're a kid, you know how your parents are like, don't do drugs. Like, don't, don't smoke weed. If you smoke weed one time, you'll be addicted forever. Marijuana. Yeah. And they try to like, they like try to like, like instill fear into you. And then you're like, really? If I do it one time, I'll be addicted for life. Like that sounds scary. That's how I feel about TikTok. Don't watch the video. If you watch one, they got you forever. But that's true. Probably. <laughs> uh, I had, I had to, now as a dad, let me tell you, Sophia, don't to, smoke marijuana. <laughs> I had to wrestle the TikTok out of his cold, dead All right, hands. what's going on with Warren Buffett? All right. Someone paid, an anonymous bidder paid a record-breaking $19 million for a private stake lunch with investor Warren Buffett. I love that he wow. does this. Wow. The sale was part of the 21st annual auction for a lunch with Buffett, produced in collaboration with eBay and the Glide Foundation. Yeah, th this is awesome that he does. I mean, $19 million. Wow. It used to be like three or four. It started, so the bidding actually started at 25 k on June 12th and ended with $19 million. Wow. Yeah, and, and look, obviously what you have is you have either uh, really wealthy asset managers or investors who are bidding for this, or you have like CEOs doing it, you know right? You probably is. Who? FTX. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think Sam Bigman Fried paid nineteen Sam, million dollars to hang Sam out with Sam Buffett? I think Sam sat down and was like, "Let's look at all the things." He he did. Uh, uh, what did he donate in twenty twenty? Donate five million dollars. Uh, He's very philanthropic. To, uh, well, I don't know. I guess this is considered phil uh, philanthropy, um, but also has the the weird thing. But how about Warren Buffett commanding ninety? Yeah, if you make a nineteen million dollar donation, you could uh, sit sit next to me while I eat my lunch that I was going to eat anyways. In, in the chat, how much would you pay to eat a steak lunch with me versus him? I I would pay you to eat with me because you don't think I'm cool. <laughs> <laughs> Hey you, did you like this video? Great, we make five of them a day and post them here on this channel. Make sure you're subscribed, like the video, and see you next time.